Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, well, golly, major surprises in the primaries for governor. And Shazam, Montgomery County executive race, too close to call, just like in 2018. And then updates on all the important state and county races. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former county council member, Nancy Foreen, and secretary of the Maryland Republican Central Committee, Mark Unkefer. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. The conventional wisdom was given a kick in the ass this year in the Maryland primary elections. Peter Franchot, who had won two statewide elections for comptroller, finished third in the Democratic primary race for governor to political neophyte and former CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, Wes Moore. In the Republican primary, the coattails of popular two-term Republican Governor Larry Hogan didn't stretch very far as Hogan endorsed former Senate Secretary of Commerce, Kelly Schultz, she lost to the Trumpanista candidate, Delegate Dan Cox. Nancy, it may be too soon to identify trends emanating from these results, but it seems that the electorate on both sides is dissatisfied with the status quo. They're in search of a new shiny object to believe in. So is that a fair assessment? Well, uh, I think the one conclusion we can draw is that it's unnecessary to have a, a campaign for governor for eight years, uh, the way Peter Francho did, um, didn't pay off. Uh, I, I think the more interesting question is what's happening on the Republican side of the equation. Uh, the Democrats are not all that different in terms of perspective and policy, but uh, I'd like to hear from Mark, what, what is the future of the Republican party in Montgomery in Maryland? Are we, gonna, are we becoming a Trump state? Well, before we get to that, <laughs> I got to control the questions. What Sorry. do you think about Wes Moore, who looks like, although it's not official, who looks like he's going to be the Democratic nominee? I think I think he's going to uh, take it. The uh, the percentage uh, the lead that he has is unlikely to be changed that much with the rest of the uh, votes that they have to count. So I think it's pretty likely he's going to be uh, the winner. You know, I don't know anything about him really. Uh, he was not my pick, uh, but I know many people who are very enthusiastic about him. He's a good speaker, uh, and he is indeed the shiny new thing. Uh, so we'll okay. see how uh, that plays out in November. So now we're going to turn to Mark. <laughs> and, and Mark, why did Republicans abandon the strategy that works so well to elect not only Larry Hogan, but also Bob Ehrlich previously? So what do, what's up? Well, I, I, I candidly, as, a, as somebody who will, full disclosure, supported uh, Kelly, I, I think there's a kind of complacency that takes place of thinking that sort of the compromises that come from uh, being responsive to the center that uh, the conservative base did not like, uh, felt, well, gee, we can, we can get somebody in, we can get in, in more. Obviously, the challenge is going to be uh, getting Dan Cox elected. And, and uh, uh, I think we would all have to acknowledge that's going to be a pretty uphill fight for him in, in a state like Maryland. Well, I mean, you can certainly see the dissatisfaction in the Republican base. I mean, that came clear because in, in the election for Cox. But, you know, will there be that same level of dissatisfaction in the general populace that will give him a chance to win in November? Well, that, that's clearly what he's banking on. He is very much focused on uh, frustration with the sort of populist issues such as frustration with the COVID mandates and what have you. Uh, I think one of the challenge he'll have is, is doing uh, pivoting more towards issues that are more, you know, bread and butter, beaten potatoes issues that care that Maryland, other Marylanders care about, the crime, uh, the economy, uh, the quality of education. Uh, and, and that will be part of uh, whether he can do that or not will be an open question. I mean, I personally, if, if I, I'm a voter and I, I'm frustrated with the level of response from the state government on education and, and on crime, 
you know, we've had good leadership from Hogan, I think, on the economy. So I think there's there's fertile ground for Dan Cox uh, to to uh, make a make inroads. But as Nancy's point uh, at the very beginning, I mean, they've already got the tar brush out, labeling him as uh, a Trumpanista, and so did I. Mm -hmm. I mean. That's so, how I yeah, refer to it, there's there's no I mean, clearly he was the, the, the Trump endorsed candidate and, and very much supported by those people who, who cared about the most about that endorsement. Yeah, but I, I mean, I question the, the Republican Party's wisdom in this. It, we all know how difficult it is to win statewide in 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 Maryland with, with the disparity in in voter registration. They've had a formula for success. Why, you know, why shoot themselves in the head? I don't get it. I don't, I mean, I don't think that this, this was not a decision that was made in a smoke filled <laughs> room. This was a decision that was made by, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of voters uh, in, in, well, not in the ballot box, there are a variety of ways to, to vote these days, but uh, in the privacy of their own ballot. Uh, and as I said, I think it reflected a certain complacency that a uh, thought thinks that, uh, uh, a disruptive candidate, a little like the Trump in uh, 2016, uh, can fare better than is expected in, in a state like Maryland. Well, I'm going to, uh, the last final question about the Republican uh, nominee. In um, 2018, Republicans did not come out and vote for Republican candidates because they were uh, upset. Many of them were with President Trump. Right. So the mainstream uh, voters who voted for Kelly Schultz? Are they going to sit out the race, or are they going to are they going to hold their nose and vote for Cox? Well, that's going to be an interesting challenge, and, and I would actually break it down by uh, congressional districts because I think we have uh, some very active uh, congressional races. Uh, I forgive me, but I'm not in one of them. I'm in District Eight, but. Uh, six is very competitive. Um, the, the other ones around Baltimore and, and cutting into Howard and, and Anne Arundel County, uh, those are very, very competitive races that uh, uh, will, will, I think, draw a substantial turnout. Uh, a and B, we have some, in other counties, some very active uh, county executive races. Uh, we're very encouraged in Anne Arundel County, the Republican primary vote was well ahead of the vote for uh, the Democrats. I think there's a real opportunity for pickup there as, as there is in Frederick Mark, County. Mark, I got to cut you off. We're, we're, we're sure. running out of time and I got to cover some other, other races. Nancy, why is it that Katie Curran O'Malley lost to Governor Brown and Lieutenant Governor Brown in the AG's race? Interesting. Uh, well, um, possibly, well, you'd think the Baltimore vote would make a difference here, but they made a difference for Brown. Uh, that seems to be the case. The O'Malley name obviously has lost its luster. Um, I was surprised by that. But yeah, I, I, I mean, it, the, the, the dual legacy of Curran and, and O'Malley, I thought was going to win the day. Yeah. And I'm really disappointed in the Republican primary that our friend Jim Shalek was defeated in uh, his race uh, for attorney general. I got to we got to keep going. I'm sorry. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the governor's race. There's really not much to talk about uh, Van Hollen's Senate race, is there? Anybody? Nope. Nope. He's the beloved child. <laughs> before before we get into another, I want to do a shout out to uh, 21 This Week panelist, Nicolae Ambrose, who won the, the Republican primary in CD2 and will take on incumbent uh, Congressman uh, Dutch Rupersberger in November. Mm -hmm. If anybody can do it, it's Nicolae. She's got effervescent personality. Uh, Nancy, uh, in the race to uh, fill the seat vacated by Anthony Brown, uh, Glenn Ivey defeated Donna Edwards. How come? Well, there was a lot of money poured into that race against Donna. Uh, so I think the uh, Israeli uh, attack on her uh, made a big difference. Uh, and Glenn is a, a terrific candidate, no question about that. And Donna had history. Uh, there's always a challenge when you go back to something. People remember what you did before, and uh, she couldn't recover from that. Yeah. So, Mark, you started talking about the uh, CD6 race. Why don't you give us a little more 
uh, detail on that. Neil Parrott lost two years ago. Does he really have, have an opportunity because of redistricting to uh, take on uh, a well-funded candidate? Well, depending on which analyst to use, it's either a D plus one or an R plus one race. So it's a very it's a very diverse district. It has large swaths of a very Republican area, and it also includes some more Democratic areas, some in Frederick and, and more in Montgomery County. Um, so it's a challenge to be able to to um, sort of pull all together those various constituencies in a wave election such as we're experiencing, I think it's gonna be quite, with new lines and a wave election, I think Neil Parrott has a much more competitive ch choice. But you did mention some of those other congressional races. I, I think that uh, both Nicolese and, and uh, the other one um, uh, where Euripsy Morgan is running against John Sarbanes is another one that has real competitive uh, potential. Hmm. Really, well, that's interesting. So Nancy, one of the things about the, the CD6 race that's always bothered me is that the candidate doesn't live in the district. And I know. I mean, my father-in-law in Michigan, they have a different, different law. And in, my father-in-law had to move three times uh, during his 36 years in, in office because he got redistricted out of his, <laughs> he had to move three times. So why shouldn't Maryland uh, put, have a higher standard here? Someone made that decision a long time ago, and it's hard yeah. to change the rules. You know, it's it's. I was shocked when I learned that you didn't have to live in the district. We got to put Robin Ficker on that. State. Get a, get a, get a <laughs> well, uh, that, constitutional I, amendment working on it, that. I don't, I don't know what the status is uh, across the state in the other congressional districts. You know, but it's uh, possible. Mark, no, can last word. I was going to quickly say is it's in the US Constitution you can't come up at the state level with a, a higher requirement so you you just have to live in the state and and that's true across the board obviously in Michigan your father-in-law chose to 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 live in his district but he didn't no, he was scared to death if he didn't live in the district that uh, he he would you know lose a lot of voters right, when we come back from this short break we're going to focus on the county council races stay tuned and welcome back. As Yogi Berra used to say, it's deja vu all over again. Montgomery County Executive and Council races where Mark Elrich, the current County Exec, and David Blair, the challenger, are neck and neck again with many mail-in ballots uncounted. Uh, Nancy, when are we gonna know an outcome in this race? Because there are just so many outstanding mail-in ballots. Yeah, uh, this is one I, I don't think anyone can have a have a celebratory a party until the 29th. Uh, it's ordinarily you could say, well, uh, Blair has the lead and that's likely to, to hold, but the margin is less than 2000 votes. And uh, I think given the number of mail-in ballots, uh, it could go either way. Uh, it's likely to hold, but I, I wouldn't swear to it. Uh, you know, there are other people who have, uh, you know, you could say, well, the people, the Mark people are more likely to have voted by mail. There are all kinds of theories out there. I, I wouldn't subscribe to any perspective at this point. It's neck and neck. It's deja vu all over again. But this time only, you know, they're really, well, there were three candidates. And of course, Hans didn't do so, as well as he hoped for. Uh, last time around, I think there were eight. So it's a whole, it is a different race this time. It's really good. David Did Hans Mark. take away from, from Mark? I think they might have split down the middle <laughs> in terms of uh, how the voters might have cast their votes otherwise. Okay. So, uh, Mark, uh, your candidate in the Republican primary, Reardon Sullivan, uh, successfully won. Uh, actually, there are two candidates, and so uh, Reardon won. Um, he's a very impressive guy, but he's got a tall order. Uh, to win countywide, uh, he does has has as a challenge, and and actually in the last week he was uh, apparently required under the board of election rules to step aside as uh, Montgomery County Republican chairman. So he gave up that position in order to uh, run for uh, run for county executive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, as you say, it's it, it's an uphill an uphill ballot battle for him. 
So yeah. we, we've got two empty, brand new spanking, sort of spanking, new uh, council manic districts that were created uh, by the charter amendment two years ago, um, number six and number seven. And um, in number six, former vice chairman of the Montgomery County uh, Planning Commission, you're going to have to help me, uh, Natalie Fani Gonzalez. Fani Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. Is she leading the race? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the good news about the council race uh, is that, uh, at least from my perspective, we're going to have uh, six women on the council. Uh, we've never had that many women on the council at all. They're going to form a majority of the new number. Uh, uh, women have, the, we, looks like we're going to have Lori Ann Sales uh, as a member of the at large team. That's where I used to be. We're going to have a woman, Marilyn Balcom, in District 2. Uh, Kate Stewart in District 4, uh, Kristen Mink in District 6, 5, uh, Natalie in District 6, and Dawn Lutke in District 7. So it's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting situation. Fun, store, fun uh, uh, games of dice were rolled here, and the players lost. Tom Hucker lost. He uh, was going to run, he was going to run in his district for county executive, and then he decided to run at large and that uh, didn't pan out for him. Al Carr lost his legislative seat. Uh, he was gonna run for the council in district four and that didn't work out for him. So it, it's been a, an interesting season of upsets uh, for people who thought that they had the voters confidence. So, so Mark, now, now that Nancy's analyzed all the races. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, so, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, Mark, your team doesn't, usually get much of a chance in these races. Well, so, I was gonna, uh, I was gonna point <laughs> out that in two of the races that uh, uh, Nancy mentioned where the quote women's pickup, um, it remains to be seen which woman will run because there's a Republican woman running against a, a Democratic woman. So Kristen Mink is running against Kate uh, Woody and uh, Kate Stewart is running against Cheryl Riley. So um, your, your at least prediction there- will Either way. Either way, either way, there'll be a, a, a return representation. Uh, obviously, Nancy, the voters just decided that they, after ha having lost you, they just wanted to have more women back on the council. That had to be it. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I was surprised by Tom Hucker losing, um, uh, coming in fourth mm -hmm. in, um, in that race. I thought he had a better better or fifth, I guess. Well, he thought he did too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, he got basically when they redistricted his uh, district, his council district got cut in half. Yeah. And uh, and so he, he couldn't stay, the, the choice of, the chance of being reelected in uh, one of the smaller districts seemed, I guess, too, too hard for him. And he assumed that because he'd been council president the year before, and um, you know the voters in uh, his district five had supported him in the past that that would be an easy race. It's interesting uh, that Lori has has pulled it off. Not an easy thing to do to oust an incumbent. Uh, uh, when I ran in 2002, we did oust an incumbent, but it was a big, big push uh, to have that incumbent uh, ousted. Uh, this was not the case at all. So this is just, you know, the voters voting. So it's very, uh, it's very interesting. Well, what I also I think, agree, it's unexpected. Well, but I also think, again, poor political calculus here. I mean, I think Tucker had aspirations to be county executive and this is kind of a major setback. Um, well, that he, went, <laughs> that he went from that race to losing this, well, it's basically yeah. the same race, uh, you know, so it's the same voters. So it's not all that different, but it's just an interesting uh, call that didn't work out. Well, we got a couple more races uh, that I wanted to talk to. One, one of the more important ones was the state's attorney's race, where it looks like uh, John McCarthy is um, going to win his fourth, fourth term. Um, I think it's interesting, uh, the vote that came out. I mean, McCarthy has pushed really hard to, in the last you know, six months to uh, 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 show his anti-crime uh, uh, bona fides, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Any thoughts about, about that race? 
I, I was surprised by how decisive it was uh, in the primary. Uh, obviously, there's been a, a spate of, of woker primary uh, d d elections, <laughs> prosecuting state's attorneys races around the country. And John McCarthy was, if ever you went to central casting to get the old style a uh, professional work up through the ranks prosecutor <laughs> is John McCarthy. And I, I mean that in a positive way. Uh, and uh, it's interesting in, in, in Baltimore, it appears that uh, uh, Mosby has been defeated. So perhaps the pendulum is shifting. Uh, well, she had, she had some baggage there, baby. I mean, yeah, to it be wasn't sure. just she was unpopular. She had lots of baggage. Uh, before I ask this next, next question, I, I want to do a shout out to our own Nancy Florine who uh, served on election day as an election judge at uh, the vote, my, the, my voting precinct in Potomac. I think that's such an admirable thing for you to have done, Nancy. I wanna give you a lot of you know, praise for that and kudos because we all need to know how important uh, you know, the integrity of the elections is, no more so than what I'm gonna bring up right now, which is, was there anything surprising about this election? No, Baltimore unsurprisingly saw a delay in produ producing results because 21 of oh, 12 flash drives were missing from the from the districts. This is this reminds me of the Glenn Denning Sourbray race in 94, where they were open up the back door of the machines. What's going well, on here? Well, that wasn't here. It, it's, it looks like they were just misfiled somewhere in Baltimore. They were returned. And I, let me tell you, as an election judge and someone who this time had to oversee the whole shebang, uh, the amount of security procedures that everyone is required to adhere to is incredible. No one should doubt the chain of custody issues that anyone working in the polls has to adhere to uh, through the polls. So, you know, there was a little glitch somewhere, but it, they weren't lost. They were just misplaced. <laughs> Are you saying the Baltimore, the Baltimore uh Flash drives? I think they were lost in somebody's uh, trunk, just like those ballot boxes. Uh, uh, they, they, well, yeah, whatever. Yeah. They, they, they believe they were put in the wrong file. Filing uh, cabinet. Mark, we got, I'm not going to give you a comment because we got to wrap it up. Sure. Stay tuned for party shots when we come back from the short break. And welcome back. Now with party shots, Nancy Florine. Uh, well, I don't know about all our viewers, but I, for one, am uh, tired of talking about politics and, the, and uh, the elections. But the good thing is uh, women, it looks like women are going to rule the Montgomery County Council. And that is a great step forward for our county. Uh, we don't always agree on issues. We're like anybody else, but it's a great visual. And since our population is more than 50 percent women, they should feel good. Uh, when they go to bed at night to know that their views are going to be represented their way. So let's have a shout out to the, the feminists of Montgomery County. Well, thank you, Nancy. Mark Onkefer, your parting shot. Well, I already mentioned uh, uh, two races in which Republican women are running against Democratic women. So we assured of a woman getting to the council. Uh, but there are also some great candidates who are also running, Dan Kuda, uh, Air Force graduate uh, and uh, PhD in public policy, Kate Woolley, who is a, a tax lawyer, was a director of the Harvard International Law Project in tax law. And uh, Viet Dong was a, a son of a Viet a Vietnamese immigrants and a lawyer as well. Uh, very, very qualified candidates who I think would add a lot to uh, the county council. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nancy. I want to thank you both for coming in uh, this week. We're going to be on uh, hiatus for uh, the rest of the, the month of July and, and the most of August. Uh, I like to pretend that I'm French and I'm going to go to the Riviera. Of course, I, of course I'm not, but um, it's, a nice, it's a nice wish. In any event, I want to thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show. For 21 this week, I'm Casey Aiken.